Thank you, Shannon, so much. Well, good morning again. It's good to see you. Happy May. Happy NHL playoff season. Uh, I want to start today by showing you a picture from our house. Um, we're doing some very minor renovations in our home. And uh, the picture on the left is the picture of the wall in our entranceway fixed. Now we're doing some renovations. We noticed on the wall there looked to be what was an old um, doorbell system there. So we took it apart. There were some wires. I cut them off, threw them down on the wall. It left a hole and then we had it patched. So the first picture is the fixed picture, the final product picture. Uh, it was wonderful to get that finally done and kind of declutter the entranceway a little bit. Uh, then you remember this week it got really cold. Do you remember that? And I woke up one day and it was 14 degrees in our house, which I believe is like 56 Fahrenheit. And I turned up my furnace and uh, nothing happened. The next day I woke up again, it was still really, really cold. And, you know, this was clearly something was wrong. So I called for some help. They came and looked at it. And as the guy was kind of walking me through it, kind of trying to problem solve, he said, it's almost as if there's some wires that are disconnected somewhere in the house. I said, wires, yes, I remember wires. So I took him to this lovely spot on the wall, nicely fixed and patched, and explained to him that there had once been a hole there, there had been once some wires there, and then out came the hammer. And what you see in the after was the result of looking for those wires. Well, we will get back to this image in a little bit. Last Sunday, we talked about, and I know that you've thought about it all week, the difference between salvation and sanctification. And I know those are, can maybe sound kind of heavy theological words. Uh, salvation is when God, through his grace, reaches out and draws us back to himself. We're lost. We've been estranged from our Heavenly Father, but God comes looking for us. And because God, who is holy and righteous and perfect, when we meet him, we immediately become aware of our own sinfulness and our brokenness when we are in his presence, that we have not met up to his standard. I mean, if we're honest, we've not met up to our own standards for life, but we certainly have not met up for the Lord's. So when we're standing in God's presence, aware that we've missed the mark, we become aware of his grace, and in that moment, we open our hearts, his grace comes in, and we become his followers. We become Christians. We become his children. And our status with God in that moment instantly changes. We're his kids. We're part of his family. And the Holy Spirit moves right into our lives in that moment. Now, while salvation instantly repairs our status with God, it does not instantly repair or renovate our character, the kind of people that we are. So we might be a Christian, but we're just learning now, what does this Christian life involve? And how is it that God begins a process of transforming me from the inside out to make me more and more like his son? Meaning this, on the outside, if you cursed like a sailor, and then that you became a Christian, that does not instantly go away or change. That is a learned behavior that you now have to, as a disciple, learn how to stop doing and, and change. It's also true on the inside. If before you became a Christian, you had anger and grief, pain from a difficult childhood, deep insecurities, those do not instantly change the moment that you become a Christian. And maybe you know people who've been a Christian for a really, really long time, and they've carried some of those wounds throughout their life. And you've believed maybe that God just really wants to get you into heaven someday. And we forget that God also wants to get heaven into us in the here and now and do the transforming healing work in us even today. And so as we embrace this life of a disciple, learning to trust God to become our leader and our healer, uh, this means that we now begin to learn to leave things behind. When you became a Christian, there were certain things that you did or attitudes that you had or ways that you behaved that you left behind and rightly so. And as we continue to follow Christ and open ourselves up to the work of the Holy Spirit, he should continually be showing us things that we still need to leave behind. One person once said, being a Christian is about having multiple conversion experiences. 
So we have our initial moment where we meet Christ and our lives are changed and we recognize there's some changes that we need to make to our life, but there should be more of those the longer that we follow Jesus. The more that we learn what following Jesus looks like, the more we let the Holy Spirit speak to us and do the work that the Holy Spirit wants to do. We come to these moments where we say, this, I need to leave this behind. This is keeping me from following Christ. This is keeping me from experiencing life to the full. Well, why am I giving you this kind of theology overview? Well, because as disciples, as people who want to become more and more like Jesus, what we're going to talk about today is really, really foundational to becoming more like him. But it's also foundational for this series that we've been talking about, about mending relationships. We've been talking about some of the ways in which in the last two years, things have gotten complicated in your relationship with people. Maybe it's at work, maybe they're neighbors, maybe they're your parents or your kids, uh, other family members, your spouse. Things have gotten more and more complicated. Things have just gotten confusing. There's been unhealthy patterns. There's been wear and tear. There's been disagreements, arguments, maybe even some relationships have completely been fractured and have ended. And with that comes loss and grief and uncertainty. So we're talking about what are some of the ways as we learn to follow Jesus and let his work take place in our lives, and as that work is going on, that it might help us become, help us mend some of these relationships in our lives. Now, this topic is going to challenge some of us because, especially today's topic, because um, it's difficult, and I'm going to be upfront with you. Today, the things we're going to talk about can be really, really hard to do. In fact, I'm not even going to use the word until later on so you don't get up and go for coffee and not come back. Um, but I really believe this, that what we're going to talk about today, if you would employ it in your own life, it will transform your walk with Jesus. It will have a radical change on your faith and your ability to trust the Lord with your life. I also believe it will be one of the most helpful things in mending any relationships that you may find difficult right now. So I'm going to invite you to turn with me this morning to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, it's on page 974. If you're using the Bible around you, you can look it up electronically as well. Psalm 139, I'm going to read the first six verses and then we'll jump to the end, to verse 23. So I invite you to either follow along or just listen as I, as I read these verses today. This is a Psalm of David. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You've laid your hand, literally your palm, upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Let's jump to verse 23. Again, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, you're probably like me. There's a certain part of your life that you're okay people knowing about, but then you've got boundaries and you don't want some people knowing all of your business. And when people push you, when people jump in, when people cross over those boundaries, it makes you uncomfortable, right? David here in this psalm is basically saying to the Lord, there's no boundaries. Search me. Know me. Look into the depths of my heart and help me figure out what is going on on in here. He does not say, check out the exterior, drive by my house, see what I look like on Sunday, visit my Instagram page. That's not what he says. He says, Lord, I am inviting you to search my heart, my anxieties, my mind, the places that people cannot see. And we all have those places, those places in our heart and mind that other people cannot see, where live oftentimes pain, and thoughts about ourselves, and really, really strong emotions. We're using for this series the framework taken from a book called Emotionally Healthy Relationships, written by Pete and Jerry Scazzario after years of pastoral ministry together in New York City. And they kind of have this, this kind of common, this theme that kind of runs throughout the book that says this, that it's impossible for you and I to be spiritually mature. So as disciples of Jesus, it's impossible for us to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally, or our inside world, 
immature. It's impossible to be a healthy disciple without dealing with those places that no one can see. That our life is like an iceberg, where the 10% that is, ex- that is above the water is the part of our life that everybody can see. But then there's that part that's beneath the water that people cannot see. And it's in those places that oftentimes we live out our life. And in fact, I would say to you today, if you maybe had somebody say to you, all that really matters in being a Christian is that top 10%, just clean up your act and be nice, and that Jesus is really not interested in that other 90%, then they've lied to you. Because Jesus wants to be Lord over all of our lives. He's not just interested in how we look on Sunday. And so the story of the Titanic comes to mind. Maybe it does to you as well. Um, The navigators that were steering the Titanic, when they they saw the iceberg before they hit it, they saw it. But what they did not see was the dangerous parts that were lying beneath the water. And as we think about our relationships and the relationships that are so meaningful in our life, so often it's the stuff that lies beneath the surface of our lives, isn't it? that causes the greatest challenge and problems in the relationships that we have, that our hurts, our pain, our insecurities, baggage that we might be carrying around from our childhood or from past relationships, complicate the relationships with the people that mean the most to us today. Any good counselor will tell you that most of us live out of that bottom 90% of our lives. And so if we're only worrying about the 10%, you're just really trying to change your behavior when Christ ultimately wants to change our hearts and bring healing to those places that nobody can see. Now, when I read this psalm, it strikes me how much trust David has in the Lord. Because you and I aren't going to open our hearts up to people that we don't trust. And I think there's a couple of clues in this passage that tell us why it is that David was comfortable opening his heart up to the Lord. I'll get you to take your your Bible back out again. I want to read just a couple of verses. Let me just first read verses 9 and 10. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your hand will hold me fast. Now this is the image of a potter working with clay. And the potter's not trying to destroy the clay. It's not trying to punish the clay or harm the clay. It's trying to bring something beautiful. And it knows if it puts a little bit of pressure here or a little bit of pressure there, it's going to help reshape the pot into the thing that the potter wants to make. In the same way, when we open our hearts up to the Lord, the Lord might push on some areas. He might call us to pay attention to some certain things. But his intent is to make something beautiful, never to harm and never to punish. The other verse is from verses 13 and 14. Some of you might be familiar with these. For you created me, David says. You created me in my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And I know that full well. David is saying, you created me. And I've got a lifetime warranty on you working and repairing my life. You created me wonderfully and beautifully made. I am somebody that you love and cherish and treasure. So your intent for me will only to be good and loving and redemptive. And this becomes important as you and I as disciples, if we're going to say to the Lord, look, search me, know me, test me, go right down into my anxious thoughts, go digging around even into my heart. Because you're the potter that loves and cares for me. You're the one who looks at me and thinks that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your intent is only going to be to restore me. So, last week we talked about managing expectations. Today, the word I want to give to you is self-awareness. Now, I know immediately some of you are thinking, oh, that sounds gross. I don't want to talk about that. Let me say this to you. You wouldn't be a Christian today without self-awareness. There was a moment in your life where the gospel of Jesus was given to you, and as you heard it, something happened in your heart. You became aware. You became aware that you could not save yourself. You became aware that God's grace was more beautiful and wonderful than any amount of working and effort you could produce. And you welcomed it into your life, and it was transformative in that moment. It was a moment of 
awareness for you. And discipleship is all about self-awareness as well. If you think about it, there's this wonderful story where Jesus is challenging his followers about being hypocrites. And he says to them, he says, you're obsessed. You're looking around at everybody, looking at the speck in their eyes, the little bit of dust in their eyes, and you have a plank sticking out of your forehead. And we read, it, we read this and we laugh and we think, how can anybody be so foolish is to spend all of their time worrying about what everybody else is doing and what they're saying and how they're living and how they raise their kids and never pay attention to the board that is sticking out of their skull. And then we realize it is so easy to become that person and to live that way. Jesus was talking about self-awareness. Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, would say this to them. He said, do not let there even be a hint of immorality, impurity, or greed in your life. Not a hint. So don't even worry about the logs and the specks. Let's get right down to the nitty-gritty. Turn the spotlight in on your life and take a look around and see if there is a hint of anything in your life that would cause you to impact your ability to show love to other people people. Now, this is what Paul is talking about. This is all about self-awareness, learning to look on the inside and say, what is going on in here that may impact my ability to show love to the people in my life? And that's the question for us today as we think about self-awareness. As you think about the relationships that you have with people that maybe need some care, that maybe aren't going well, and maybe that you're just thinking, I have no idea where they're even at, or maybe they're just broken and they've kind of ended. The question of a disciple, the question that we would ask today is this. What have I contributed to that relationship that caused it to go this way? What's going on inside of me that contributed to this relationship falling apart? Now, I'm going to say to you today, there's an exception to this. If you're in a relationship where you are not physically or emotionally safe, then this does not apply to you, and do not try to practice this. Um, if that describes you today, then I encourage you to find somebody that you trust, let them know, and see how it is that they may be able to help you. But this is, could be a life-giving question for the rest of us. If we as disciples look in and say, how has my anger or my frustration leaked into the relationships in my life and made them more complicated? How have my insecurities or my fear of trust or my inability to commit impacted my ability to be a good friend or to be a good coworker? And if this, you kind of sitting here thinking, oh, I don't think I got any of that stuff going on, then here, take out your phone and I want you to text three people who know you best. And I want you to ask them this question. Um, hey, is there anything that I do to make it difficult to be a friend with me? And if they don't answer you, or they tell you, oh, actually, I stopped using a cell phone and I don't check my phone anymore, or I've already given up my cell phone for Lent for next year in advance, uh, then maybe that would be a hint that they have some things, but they don't want to tell you about them. For your listening pleasure, let me share two things that I've learned about myself in this last couple of years. Um, the first is this, when I get overwhelmed, I avoid people. This is something that I've been learning about myself. My wife and I did uh, a personality um, kind of quiz last year. I did some reading on personality types. And I it was incredible to learn some things about myself that when I feel tired or overwhelmed, I avoid or ignore people. Now, in case you're wondering, avoiding and ignoring people is a horrible skill for a relationship, okay? It's not good. The other is this. When I feel frustrated by everyone in my life, it really means I'm frustrated with me. And then I need to take a time out and sit down and figure out, everybody in the world cannot be frustrating me. This really can't be the problem. What is it that's going on within me right now that's causing me to feel this way? And here's the funny thing. When you make these discoveries, okay, they're lightning. I can't believe I didn't know this about myself. And then you actually get the courage and you mention it to somebody around you that's closest to you. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to go, oh yeah, I've known that for years, right? This is the reality. Having this knowledge doesn't make it go away, but it helps us as disciples ask the question, God, how is it that you can be at work in my life? So that in these relationships that mean so much to me, I'm not contributing to their undoing. And so here's the question I would get you to ask today. 
Think about the relationships in your life that need some tender, loving care, that need some attention, and would you be brave enough to ask yourself today, how, what is it that I bring that makes this relationship more complicated? Do I have hurts or insecurities? What is it that I am contributing to making this relationship not work? And this is not punitive. This is not about being negative. This is not about crushing our self-esteem and beating ourselves up. Not at all. Think about Psalm 139. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. The hand of the potter is on my life, shaping me and guiding me, holding me fast and wanting to make something beautiful from my life. And I want to participate in that, not work against it. And as painful as this is, and as uncomfortable as this might be, this will open our hearts up to the Lord's work in ways that maybe we've never experienced before. And it will help us in the relationships, improve the relationships that we have with other people. So let's come back to this uh, picture of my entranceway. It was really painful to see the hammer go through that wall after the wall had been fixed and leaving this ugly hole. The option was I could have ignored the problem. It looked nice on the outside. It was all fixed up. It looked great. Now we would have never had heat again, and maybe global warming would come really fast and we would never have to worry about that. But we could not ignore the discomfort for the sake of our self-image. So doing the uncomfortable work of opening up the wall, fixing the problem so that it could be made well, uh, was the right thing, even though it was the difficult thing to do. And for me, this is what discipleship looks like. Disciples are people who are willing to let the Lord knock a few holes in their heart and dig around a little bit and show them some things that need some work. Not to hurt, but to heal. This is the work that we do as Christians who want to help mend some of the relationships in our lives. We allow the Lord to punch some holes in there and say, look, here's some of the things that you might be bringing to the relationship that are making it not work. And in doing so, the result is freedom. Because we're all the same. We have people in our life that we really, really love. We have people in our life that are good friends, and we just love having them around, and they add color to our life. They add joy to our life. They give meaning to our life in an inexplicable kinds of ways. And it becomes indicative of all of us as Christ followers to continue to learn to say, how can I be better at loving these people? Let's pray. Lord, today we thank you that you are not just interested in the exterior of our life. We thank you today that you care about all that's going on beneath the surface. For you made us, you see us, you know how we work, you know what's going on underneath the waters. And Lord, there is nothing that you would find there that would scare you away. There is nothing that you would find there that would cause you to walk away from us. Lord, there is nothing that you would find there that your grace cannot attend to, even here this morning. So give us the courage, like David, to give you the invitation to search us and to know us, Lord, that we might be fashioned and shaped and moved towards wholeness. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.